Good afternoon or good morning or good evening or good ever whatever time of day this finds you. My name is Keith Beecroft. I'm a health promoter with Peterborough Public Health and I'm joined by my colleague Janet Dawson and we're going to walk you through some of the ins and outs of, of using a, a meeting and event space and, and what that looks like during the COVID-19 pandemic and, and some things you need to consider moving forward. Um, before we get to that though, Janet, I would like to turn it over to you for our, our recognition, please. Perfect. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Mishisage territory and in the traditional territory of the Mishisage and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaties First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaties First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of our lands, of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. And even though we are not able to gather in person for this typical uh, um, educational event, uh, it reminds me that no matter where we are today listening to this webinar, we are all on treaty lands and I'm very thankful that uh, we have this land to enjoy. Over to you, Keith. Terrific. Thanks, Janet. Couple disclosures before we get going. Um, you'll hear the term meeting and event space throughout this uh, this this webinar and, and really it's speaking to the both the people that own and operate these facilities but also the people that may rent uh, or otherwise use one of these facilities so um, off the top we just want to make sure that people are, are listening to the right webinar and if you're planning a, a meeting or event or some sort of family celebration uh, you're in the right spot and likewise if you own one of these places or or public or private um, you're in the right spot as well it, it's really going to speak to both the, the owners and the users of these spaces. One of the things that's uh, very true throughout this pandemic is that things seem to change, uh, if not hour by hour anymore, certainly day to day. Uh, and all of that to say that as of April 6th, uh, this information is current and, and when in doubt, reach out. Uh, we're happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Uh, but as of April 6th, 2021, this is the most current information that we have from the ministry. Um, Likewise, this this is really educational material only. We're happy to walk through uh, and guide you and provide you some resources and tools, um, but by no uh, way, shape or form should this be misconstrued as, as legal advice. Um, it, it really is kind of a, a synthesis of all of the information that's out there so that you're able to make an informed decision for both using and um, operating one of these spaces. Likewise, uh, re the Reopening Ontario Act is, is what all of this is based on. And in some instances, there might be local rules, and we're, we'll certainly touch on that. Uh, but by and large, um, all of the, the, the rules and regulations are, are found under the ROA or the Reopening Ontario Act. But in the instance, uh, as an example, where there are local instructions uh, that have come from Peterborough Public Health, whether that's uh, a letter of instruction or a recommendation or a Section 22 you might hear, um, in the instance where there's a more restrictive um, set of legislation, it's the more restrictive one that uh, applies. So there's a, a culmination of pieces that, that we need to be aware of, and we'll discuss all of them throughout this uh, presentation. And likewise, all of these resources are available on our website. The disclosure 2.0 to build off of that is that we're we're really talking about meeting and event spaces again publicly owned and privately owned facilities whether they're indoors or they're outdoors uh, in what might be considered the traditional uses of these spaces so those would be wedding showers or bar mitzvahs receptions uh, those types of celebratory get-togethers on the flip side we do know that many of these spaces are used for in-person teaching and instruction and art classes and first aid training and, and sports and those types of things in which case there would be a separate set of uh, rules and regulations that would fall under those. So we just want you to be sure that when you're going through this presentation that um, it's not a carte blanche, do what you want in one of these spaces, because then in, in some instances there might be an additional set of rules that are applied to these meeting and event spaces. All of that to say, we're going to spend the next half an hour or so talking a little bit about how COVID is, is spread and, and what that means in meeting and event spaces. You've heard a lot about the Ontario uh, reopening framework or the response framework, and we're going to walk you through some of the color codes and what those implications are for the Peterborough Public Health Region. Uh, we'll provide some guidance for the facility owners and operators, the people, the staff, the volunteers that work in these places. 
uh, for those that are organizing events and meetings in these places, uh, as, as well as the people that just might be visiting these places. So there's kind of those three levels of use within one of these facilities, and we'll walk you through um, all three levels of, of what can be expected and what, what people need to do in, in terms of their participation at these events. Primarily, we want to talk about how to prevent COVID um, from being spread at these events. And likewise, we really want to talk about then, you know, heaven forbid something happened at one of these events, what to do in the event that COVID uh, is acquired or you become aware of a patron that does have COVID at one of these spaces, what to do then. And then by and large, we've got lots of resources that we're going to share with you as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Janet, who's going to walk you through uh, many of the next pieces uh, with regards to meeting and event spaces. Janet. Right, so this is the um, the COVID-19 uh, website that we have available um, on our web page. This is where you can get all of the information and you can follow along on this presentation. Um, I, we have on our website and it is under the meeting and event spaces. You can link to it off the main COVID-19 page. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 um, is spread mainly from person to person, and that is through the respiratory droplets of somebody infected with COVID-19. So we have all learned to know what physical distancing means and that importance of that two meters. That is because the respiratory droplets can travel up to two meters um, when somebody is coughing, sneezing, or talking. Um, and you can also transmit COVID-19 when you touch a surface or object that has the virus on that and then touch your mouth, nose, or eyes. Now, given the close contact of some um, types of activities that happen during a meeting or an event, these are considered high risk activities for COVID-19 transmission. And we strongly encourage social connection and, and social cohesion at this time, but we also recognize that physical distance is a priority. Um, we strongly advise participants to consider their own personal circumstances and risk factors um, uh, and their exposure to the virus when making decisions about going out and participating in meetings and events. So in summary, the main points that we really want you to be aware of is that COVID-19, the transmission of COVID-19 increase with close contact, closed spaces, crowded places, and especially when there's forceful exhalation, like singing or any type of physical activity or dancing, um, close contact is the highest risk for sure. And limiting that is essential to keeping our economy open. The virus doesn't move, but we move, and we are the reason that it spreads. So many of you may be familiar um, with the COVID-19 response framework. Um, in Ontario, we have a color coding framework that guides the COVID-19 restrictions and measures that are in place. As of April 6th, the time of recording of this webinar, we are in shutdown. So the entire province is being dictated by shutdown requirements that the province has put in place. But but when we resume after the shutdown period, we will resume in the COVID-19 response framework. And you can see there are five color codes, green, yellow, orange, red, and gray for lockdown. So there's an associated rule book or regulation with each color. So it's very important as an organizer or of an event or a facility operator, um, that you are aware of each corresponding regulation um, for the color code. So this really is the rule book that you must follow. And we've provided the names of the regulations here on the slide, but we also have the direct um, hyperlink for you in the resource page at the end of this presentation. So in the regulation, you will find that there is a specific section for meeting and events. There are also general compliance sections, but there is a meeting and events section that will dictate some of the specifics that we'll talk about today. Um, you may be aware that the province does change the color of each public health region. Um, they typically announce color changes every Friday. So for the Peterborough Public Health region, we could experience a change rather quickly. So you could be planning your event for uh, June um, and and work it all out according to the color code that we are in. But by the time your event comes, 
it will we will be in a different color code. So you have to be prepared to pivot your event depending on the color of when um, the event actually takes place. So on, as I mentioned today, April 6th, we are in shutdown so that there isn't anything that can take place um, right now. After the 28 day shutdown period, we are hoping that we will resume in the COVID-19 response framework, and which is the color coded framework. But Peterborough Public Health typically receives a day's notice, not even sometimes, of what color we will be changing to. So it can happen quite rapidly. The province makes the decision um, of what color code we should be in based on a number of indicators. Um, our local case counts are one of the, is one indicator, but also we have to take into consideration the capacity of our local hospital system, the capacity of our public health system to do proper case and contact tracing. Um, we also have to consider um, what is the number of variants of concern that are circulating in our community, as well as the percent positivity rate coming back from the testing site. So there's numerous indicators that take into effect, uh, take into consideration how our color code is assigned each week. Terrific, thanks Janet. So jumping in a little bit more now that we have that overview, um, we're really talking about right now for the, the facility owners and operators that these facilities must be modified um, to include all of those restrictions and, and requirements that Janet talked about earlier. Things like having one door for entry, one door for exit, how the tables are going to be set up. What are you going to do um, within the lavatory uh, to make sure that people are able to physically distance there in terms of closing off potentially urinals and, and those types of things. That's the level of detail that owners and operators are really going to have to think about uh, when they're thinking about opening or reopening to make sure that those requirements are met. The responsibility falls to the facility operator to make sure that everything is compliant, but there is also responsibility that falls to the person that's going to be using that space as well. So it's a really uh, a partnership here that the facility owner and operator must have with the person that's rented their, their facility for whatever the event is. And then on the, on the flip side of that, it really is uh, up to the person that is using the facility to make sure that their guests are, are following the rules as well. So again, it kind of speaks to that three levels of, of requirements, both on the, the level of um, the owner and operator uh, and the way that the facility is set up and, and kind of those structural changes, but then it flows down to the requirements of the individual as well. So we really need to make sure that all of the user groups um, are following the public health measures. They understand what the risk is to the people that are going to be there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a safety plan coming up, but how everything is, is spelled out and then again, communicate, communicate, communicate with the people that will be using that space to make sure that everybody is aware of, of what the game plan is and everybody is aware of what their personal responsibility is and so on and so forth to make sure that these events are as safe as possible. That said, um, there is some some uh, requirements as well for the, the meeting and, and event organizers themselves. And the reason that this slide is different is, is because as a facility operator, the requirements for a baby shower or a bar mitzvah are going to be slightly different than that of a family reunion or a wedding. So you really need to make sure that you're working with event organizers to make sure that the, the event that they're planning to use in your space is as compliant and as safe as possible and recognizing that uh, the needs and wants and activities at each event is going to be different, which is why um, the, the facility itself has to have a safety plan, but also the users of the facilities need to have a safety plan as well. That plan must be posted publicly so that people are, that are coming in are aware of what the expectations are. It's an assurance to public health inspectors and Ministry of Labor staff that, that uh, due diligence has been done and, and a checklist has been gone through to make sure that all of the requirements are being met. At the minimum, and again, all of this is linked in the resources, there are two, two resources on the Ministry of Health's website. One is a checklist to walk through um, a safety plan in, in terms of the requirements, in terms of hand sanitizer and cleaning and, and those types of things. And then the other one is a template as well that you can put all of that information in. And to make it easier for both the facility operators and the event users, We've taken all of that information and uh, put it on the website that Janet talked about at the very beginning so that there is a, a very specific document for meeting and event guidance. 
However you're going to use that space needs to be reflected uh, in the safety plan and how you use that space is reflected in that guidance document. So it's it's it sounds a lot more onerous and daunting than it really is, but it, it really is an exercise to make sure that you've thought through the entire process of how you're going to be using these spaces and, and so on and so forth. One of the things too that we want to point out is that for municipally owned buildings, the only people that can rent and occupy that space are people that live in Peterborough Public Health catchment area. That is to say the two First Nations and Peterborough City and Peterborough County. Everybody else at this time, we're asking that you stay away. Um, we're happy to welcome you back when things settle down a little bit. But right now, municipally owned spaces can be only rented and occupied by people that live in Peterborough Public Health area. So if you are planning, as an example, a wedding uh, or something that typically celebrates with lots of people from lots of places, you'll really need to consider the space and the guest list and, and alternative ways that you might be able to celebrate with people from out of region. Likewise, um, if there's an opportunity to do virtual celebrations or postponements, um, that's something to certainly uh, to think about as well for a private facility. Um, we're not saying that it's it's totally forbidden at those private facilities, but certainly the risks don't change just because of the type of building and that you might want to consider not inviting people from outside of the region, uh, which is contrary um, to the provincial guidance, which basically says, please stay in your own region at this time. So for the attendees as well, we've talked about what the facility operators have to do in terms of kind of the structural flow. We've talked about the organizing uh, parties in terms of what they need to do to think through what the space is. But if you're going to be a guest at one of these spaces, there's some things that you need to consider. And, and, and some of them, quite frankly, are uh, a little bit contrary. And we know that to uh, attending a meeting and event, um, we hear a lot about the stay at home orders and, and those types of things. The, the general rule of thumb right now is, is to stay at home uh, as much as you can, to avoid social gatherings, household contacts only, and if you can attend virtual events, uh, those would be the top um, top recommendations. Likewise, traveling for essential reasons. And, and while this speaks to people that might be coming to the Peterborough area, it would be it, it would be um, considered as well to think about going the other way and, and perhaps declining an invitation if you were invited to a, an event out of region as well. At the end of the day, though, if you do choose to attend um, one of these events, you've done that risk assessment that we've talked about at the very beginning. And for whatever purposes or reasons um, it's necessary to attend this social gathering or this meeting and event space, please don't go to that event if you have symptoms, even if they're mild. Make sure that you're doing all of the things that we've been practicing and preaching for the, the last 11, 12, 13 months in terms of hand hygiene and, and washing your hands thoroughly. Uh, we've heard lots of great uh, stories about the COVID alert mobile app working, especially if you're if you're getting together with people that you don't live with and you don't know where that they've been. Um, that COVID alert app has is, is been vital in, in terms of alerting people to potential exposures. And at the end of the day, if you do have symptoms that are compatible with COVID-19, make sure that you're getting tested to make sure uh, that it is just a cold, uh, in which case you still want to stay home. Or if it is COVID-19, that you're able to follow the precautions that will be um, discussed with you by the, the healthcare system. Uh, so by and large, lots of things to think about from both the, the attendees' point of view, the organizers' point of view, and the facility owners' point of view. We mentioned a little while ago uh, the safety plan and by and large uh, this safety plan is the document um, that the public health inspectors will be looking for for uh, upon inspection that the Ministry of Labour will be looking for and what this safety plan does is it assures the people that will be working there and that will be visiting there that you've done everything you can uh, to make sure that the event will be as safe uh, and, and as possible and really reduce that risk of exposure to COVID-19. It walks you through everything from you know start of day through end of day and, and all points in between. Janet's going to talk a little bit more about screening, um, but in terms of reducing the risk of transmission. Uh, what will you do if, if that happens, that somebody does acquire COVID-19 at your facility? Uh, are there new risks that are that are changing to the way that you operate, whether that's a variant of concern or a new activity that's permitted, like singing or dancing? Um, it needs to be a fluid document that can be updated uh, as new regulations and requirements come up uh, to date. And then at the end of the day, we really want to know how will you make sure your plan is working? What checks and balances do you have to, to figure out that, yes, the screening process is working or, or no, the screening process isn't working? Um, how are you going to be able to tell that the safety plan is working? Again, each of these scenarios is going to be slightly different based on um, the facility, uh, but we just need to make sure that you're going through the process to, to identify and, and be able to answer all of those ministry questions. Janet? 
Great. So the safety plan is an integral component, but there are some very key specific sections that we will want to see or any inspector um, coming to your premise will want to see um, in your safety plan and screening is is a big one. Um, there are requirements in the regulation for screening um, that you you must actively screen your staff and any volunteer who are assisting with the meeting and event. So if you're a facility operator, that means all your staff or anybody um, volunteering to support your work at that facility. Um, but if you're an event organizer, all your volunteers and any staff working behind the scenes um, needs to make sure that they have completed an active screening component um, before they begin their shift or before they enter the facility. Now there is, um, we have provided links, particularly at the end of the of end of the presentation, to the Ontario COVID-19 Worker and Screen um, Employee Screening Tool. Uh, you don't have to use this tool per se as part of your screening program, but you have to make sure your screening program covers off the minimum questions that are in the Ontario tool. So you just have to make sure that your whatever platform you use coincides with the questions the ministry asks. And I will give you a little uh, heads up. The ministry of uh, um, the Ontario government often changes the screening questions. So it's advisable that you keep checking back the screening questions to make sure that your tool that you are using is always using the most up-to-date questions. Um, for patrons, it is strongly recommended that you implement an active screening program for anybody who attends, any member of the public, um, any guest who's coming into your meeting or event space or attending the event, it is strongly recommended that you include an active screening com um, component. However, this is why it's so important to know the color coding framework, because as soon as we switch into orange or red, um, and so orange and more restrictive measures, active screening becomes a mandatory component. So it is a requirement in the regulations for orange and the more restrictive zones that you must actively screen your patrons. And again, the uh, ministry um, does provide an online tool for you to use if you should so choose, but just making sure your platform covers off the questions that the ministry asks for. What's another important component is that you are recording, keeping track of the names of people who are at your event or at your facility for this event. So there's contact tracing so that in the event there is a case, public health can access this, um, these records and can begin doing our contact tracing. So the, just to note though, the records need to comply with privacy requirements and could be requested by us, um, but they don't necessarily, are, are not always requested by us. You should keep them um, for a minimum of 30 days. So back to my previous point about knowing the color code you are in or the color zone. It's so important for you to plan your event um, so that it is fluid, so that you can adapt it um, based on the color that we are assigned. As I mentioned, those colors can change on a moment's notice. Typically the announcements come every Friday, but the province can announce a color change for a region um, within a matter of a day. So it's important that your plans are very fluid and are adaptive for the color that we are in. Plus, knowing each of the colors will also dictate additional requirements for your event. So there will be, uh, all activities will need to be modified for physical distancing, um, but then there'll be additional gathering rules depending on the color that we are in. There will be food and drink uh, modifications that will have to be made, or they may be suspended entirely depending on the color that we are in. You need to plan your event so that only households sit together. Anybody else requires a minimum of two meters distancing um, unless separated by an impermeable barrier. And it's really important that if we want to try to protect everybody um, who attends these events, then there, it should be communicated to attendees that they should only travel with members of their immediate household to the event. That will ensure protection, especially once they get there.
So one of the things that we hear a lot about in, in terms of, of these events is indoor versus outdoor. And uh, all of the discussion and, and all of these details are, are captured in those regulations that Janet spoke to earlier. Really what happens is, is that if it's an indoor event, it's indoors. If it's outdoors, it's outdoors. For it to be an outdoor event, yes, people are permitted to come in and use a lavatory or the washroom. Yes, people can walk through a building to get to, uh, you know, whatever the outdoor area may be. Um, or in the instance of, of health and safety, a tornado or, or severe thunderstorm, etc. Obviously, somebody can come in. But by and large, um, if it's an indoor event, it's happening indoors. If it's an outdoor event, it's happening outdoors. Even if those events are, are happily, happening in, in areas that are partially one way or another, um, it, it's one or the other. It, it can't be both. And, and that's to say, too, that an indoor event cannot be combined with an outdoor event. So quite often we'll look at the outdoor gathering limits um, and it'll have a, a number of 25, as an example, with an indoor limit of, of 10. No, the event in total cannot have 35 people attending it. It is a one or the other quite plainly. Furthermore, we get this one a lot as well. For the facility to be considered outdoors, the structure must have at least two full sides that are fully open. So while a barn might be more um, spacious, um, it is still considered an indoor structure and subsequently indoor limits would apply. Likewise, we've had a lot of people that have been calling in wondering about wedding tents. Wedding tents can be considered outdoors. However, some of the ones that we've seen where the, the zippers only zip up partially and then they're kind of folded back, that would not be considered fully open, nor would it can be considered have two full sides available. So in that instance, the wedding tent uh, would only be considered outdoors if two walls were fully removed uh, and, and that was um, completely open to the outdoors. So just to speak to this one, indoors and outdoors cannot be combined to have higher limits. And when we're talking about outdoors, we're really talking about outdoors. We're not talking about structures that are outdoors. Janet? Perfect. Um, thanks. Now we're going to move into um, some of the other requirements for you to think through um, around physical distancing. So this is really your traffic flow plan, if you will. So you will need to make sure you think through um, every everything from the moment the guests arrive in the parking lot to where they will walk, how they will enter the facility or event your event space, um, where they will stand, what will the distancing look like, um, how they will move about your event, um, and then how they will vacate. So, so you'll have to literally walk through as the attendee and create plans according to how that will, how they will move through your event. So you may need to um, start, stagger, um, start and stop times of different um, events or or different components of your event that you have taking place. Um, you may need to um, create parking lot plans um, for how people will arrive so there's not uh, gathering or congregating in the parking lot. Um, you will need to potentially have one way um, uh, sidewalks or, or aisles um, and uh, particularly maybe for the exit of the event you'll have to go out a totally different door uh, so that you can maintain one-way traffic flow. So the physical distancing will be a critical component of your safety plan um, and you will need to detail that in the document for your safety plan. Um, you need to make sure that at all times there's two meters from anyone who is not from the same household. Cleaning and disinfecting is also a requirement in the regulation, and this will come down to the facility, but it also comes down to the event organizer. So it is clearly um, dictated in the regulation that businesses or places that are open shall, shall ensure that equipment, washrooms, locker rooms, change rooms, showers, anything that is accessible to the public are cleaned and disinfected as frequently as possible. So for your facility operator, um, they you need to make sure if you're an event organizer that that's being done to protect your attendees. If you are attending a location um, and, and you have uh, you're organizing an event that has commonly touched surfaces, uh, maybe there's a, a registration pen, um, you will need to make sure that 
anything that's frequently touched is a cleaned and disinfected and shared items cleaned and disinfected between use. So we have provided a link on this page as well as in our resource page um, to the Health Canada list of approved products so that you can make sure that when you are, are cleaning and disinfecting, you are using the most appropriate products for this, uh, for this purpose. Great. So one of the other pieces too, and this is kind of where we talk about kind of the Rubik's Cube piece and get everything to line up so that everything is working together. All of these things that we're talking about uh, are really designed like a Lego kit. They're, they're meant to be part of a, an entire system. And one of those pieces too is, is around face coverings as well. By and large, any person that's indoors must wear a face covering uh, or a non-medical mask that covers their mouth, nose and chin. So we've seen a lot of uh, mingle masks or protective shields and, and those types of things um, in an effort to really have that source control to protect those respiratory droplets from leaving one person and, and entering another person. The, the, the non-medical mask or the face covering must fit securely to the person's mouth, nose and chin. So um, we've seen lots of examples of homemade ones. Um, there's lots that are commercially available as well. Um, obviously, there are some exemptions that, that apply, but by and large, uh, these these products need to to not be a buff or not be a a, a mingle mask or, or those types of things. And that when you're indoors, with the exception of the times that you're perhaps eating, um, you've got that on on the whole time. Um, just because you have one of these products on, a non-medical mask or a, or a face shield or what have you, in the instance where a face shield is appropriate, um, the physical distancing requirements are still in effect. Uh, by and large, physical distancing and a face covering um, is what we need to achieve kind of that maximum safety. So really what, what boils down to is that if you're indoors as an attendee, as an event organizer, as a staff or a volunteer, please make sure you're wearing a face mask with, with some exemptions, obviously. One of the things that's a little bit different, though, is that for, and this would be for the facility owner, um, if, if you have staff that will be serving at these functions, uh, or likewise, if you're a, an event uh, organizer and you're going to be bringing in catering or, or some other type of food service, if it's permitted in the framework, that there's additional uh, requirements required for people that are going to be coming into contact with people that are unmasked. So the scenario being, one of the exemptions is that you're allowed to take your mask off if you're eating or drinking. Okay, so I'm sitting at the, the dining table um, and we have that wait staff or the server who are coming up to the unmasked person. In the event that the staff is going to be coming um, within two meters of an unmasked person, in addition to um, the, the requirements on the previous screen, we're actually upgrading the requirements and they actually need PPE or personal protective equipment. Now this means that it's a medical or a surgical mask, so it, it's not your homemade one, it's not one that you found uh, easily online, uh, but it's actually certified as medical or surgical. And additionally, you need to have eye protection as well. Janet mentioned that the route of transmission can come from touching um, unmasked uh, so that's one of the reasons why um, eye protection is required in this instance as well. Again, there's a Health Canada checklist as to what those requirements are, and we'll be sure to share those in the resources. So plainly, servers, waitstaff, etc., who are serving unmasked patrons need to be wearing uh, additional PPE. Great, and I might just add to the um, face covering and um, PPE section that um, you may be planning an outdoor event and um, face coverings and uh, non-medical masks are strongly recommended for your outdoor event as well. Um, however, the PPE requirement for your staff that may be coming within two meters, um, that is a requirement whether it's indoor or outdoors. So I just thought I, may, I would highlight that for those of you that are planning outdoor events. Now, We've gone through the safety plan. We've gone through the components of the safety plan. You have worked tirelessly to prevent COVID-19 and something unfortunate may occur where someone becomes unwell at your event or there is COVID-19, um, somebody identifies that they've had COVID-19 and they have been at your event. What should you include in your safety plan? Well, of course, if anybody becomes unwell at the facility or during the activity or during your event, um, you need to make sure that you advise the facility operator as they too may have protocols in place for that uh, facility. 
you need to make sure this individual separates themselves from anybody else. Um, they need to put on their face covering. So if they were eating um, and they, they don't feel well, they need to put on their face covering immediately, separate themselves and do not continue participating in the activity. They need to go home immediately. Um, and I know that may be difficult depending on how they were able to travel to your event. Um, it would be advisable, if at all possible, to avoid any ride sharing or public transportation, especially if they're not feeling well, and to use private transportation. Now, they, they would have completed a screening um, attending the event, hopefully. Uh, however, it's important to, to have them rescreen themselves because it's the prompts at the end of the screening tool that's so important for what this person should do next. So they go through the screening tool again, um, they indicate what symptom they're feeling, and then the screening tools will prompt them on what to do next, whether they self-isolate, whether they seek testing. The screening tools will also provide you with a list of testing centers that are close by. Um, and of course, seek medical attention as this, um, depending on the severity of the symptoms. Now, if you learn that somebody has uh, become positive with COVID-19 um, after you've had your event, I, we just want to reassure you that you may not necessarily receive contact from Peterborough Public Health. This will depend on the amount and type of information that we receive from the individual who is confirmed positive. So the individual will, will, will go get testing, we, Peterborough Public Health, if they live in our health unit area, will receive the positive notification and then we will contact the individual to begin their case and contact uh, tracing interview. So if we receive enough information and we are able to do the risk assessment appropriately, then you may not necessarily hear from us. However, if we do require additional information, we will be in touch. Um, so if you do learn of somebody who has COVID-19 that may have attended your event, it is important that you that you are aware that this is personal health information and you should maintain the confidentiality of this um, individual. Um, ensure that they do not return to the event or the meeting space, especially if it takes place over consecutive days, um, unless they have received clearance from Peterborough Public Health. So that is why the screening tools are so important because uh, a couple of the questions on the screening tool would prompt the individual about whether or not they are positive or a high risk contact that Peterborough Public Health is working with. Um, do not attempt to initiate contact tracing on your own. That is Peterborough Public Health's role, and we will be in touch if we require additional information. However, it is important to note that if you do learn of two or more participants who have been at your event or at your facility um, within 14 days, please, by all means, reach out to us. You can reach out to us at any point in time. <clears throat> We just wanted to reassure you we may not necessarily be in touch with more information. However, as we know the world of COVID is always changing, if you do learn of two or more, please reach out to us right away as there may be something more going on that we are not aware of. Awesome. And just to wrap things up, we're starting to say, you know, when when this pandemic is over, not if this is over. It's it's certainly getting closer now than we ever have been. We're about 13 months into this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the tunnel is getting shorter and the light is getting brighter. But it really is going to be a lot of these collective actions that help us get across the finish line. So when you are having a, a meeting or an event or, or a gathering of some kind that you are following the rules, um, that you're aware of the level of the framework response that we're in and that subsequent activities have been altered so that they're uh, compliant with the regs. But plainly, those regulations are in place because uh, they will help, like Janet mentioned, keep us healthy and safe, but also allow us to keep on going to the places that we enjoy. So with all of that said, we know that meetings and events are going to look a lot different this year. But if you do the, the active and, and passive screening that we talked about and you have those thorough safety plans that walk through different scenarios and, and the use of the space, that you're really following the capacity limits, which are you know tied to the, the risk level um, identified in the response framework, and that you modify and adapt the services and activities, 
you can you can have lower risk activities. I won't say low or no risk, but certainly lower. And it's it's again those collective actions that will really help you know protect yourself as a facility owner operator, uh, but also as an attendee and and if you're offering a, a gathering for your guests. So with all of that said, like Janet mentioned, we are here to help. Uh, we know that information changes on a dime. We know that information is is fast and furious. If you do have any questions, by all means, reach out and, and we'll, we'll be certainly happy to help sort through what level of the response framework we're in and, and what implications that has for your meeting and event. Uh, walk you through what those uh, safety plans might look like. Just a note that we don't need to approve those safety plans, but we're certainly happy to support you in the development of them. Uh, as, especially since they're a requirement for, for everybody, whether it's a facility owner or um, the event uh, organizer. And all of that to say, all of these resources, and there's lots of them, so I'm not going to go through them all now. We're going to have them posted on, on the resource section of this website in a ready-to-find spot. Uh, but by and large, we thank you for everything that you're doing. We know this isn't easy. We know that you've had to pivot. Um, but we are so appreciative of your efforts. And on behalf of Janet, myself, and Peterborough Public Health, we wish you well.